Okay, our next speaker is Abebe. Um, this is, uh, uh, he is the German Research Chair at uh, Ames Rwanda. And he's going to talk to us about the prob probabilistic constraint approach to machine learning models. Yes, Abebe, you have it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, actually, this is the second talk. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, in the classical sense a machine learning specialist, but uh, I wanted to really do something. And uh, some uh, before I even came to Rwanda, I started to think about uh, a different way of modeling um, the loss function in uh, particularly supervised learning. So this work, actually, uh, even if I had that idea when I was in Germany, but I could not have time to really think about it properly and try to do some uh, research, uh, preliminary research. So uh, just it's only recently that we have done uh, some experimentation. So the topic is probability constraint approach to machine learning models. Uh, so. Actually, I say if you follow the road taken by others, you will reach the same destination they have arrived. In fact, uh, where all things are like, there is little danger of innovation. So that means uh, it's always good to go out of the box and go a different way. But uh, I'm not going totally uh, different, a totally different way. Uh, let me just uh, just tell you the a different. Um, topic that I would like to address briefly, uncertainties, uh, constraints of uncertainty, importance of uncertainty, consideration of uncertainty in machine learning models, strategies for addressing existing strategies, and why I just chose the probabilistic approach, and then uh, how I can use the research that I've been doing for several years, particularly the about which I have, talking, I have spoken today. And also, I'll present a toy example and further studies because it's only a preliminary study. So, in fact, in general, there are lots and lots of uncertainties. So, uh, uh, you have always, uh, th I like this poster because uh, uh, watch out the source of your data, actually. Who is going to give you the data? It may, may be a wrong data uh, with total noise. So, this is a very nice uh, uh, Carton that I got from the internet. The source is uh, actually Scott Adam. So, in general, no data is perfect, and in machine learning, no, no, no time data is sufficient. No data is sufficient actually. In particular, if you are uh, trying to design large-scale models for uh, complex problems, you have uh, uncertainty in the data, noise and error, wrong data, wrong model, as in the. Mo so uh, lack of sufficient data, missing data, if you are considering sensor measurements, and also records, most of the time there are missing data. There are gaps in your data. You may have shift in distribution, particularly if you are considering uh, time series data, you, have, you may have shift in the distribution of the data. You may have imprecise model parameters and, uh, and so on and so on. There are many sorts of uncertainty, that's why today uh, the uh, state of the art actually is probabilistic machine learning. So that's why uh, everyone is going in that direction. So, in fact, in the literature, people have already uh, given examples of misclassifications due to, uh, and also misrecognition. So therefore, you have uh, these examples in the literature, wrong classifications. You have also these wrong classifications, which you find in the, in, uh, the internet in the published work, actually. In fact, in general, uh, what we have is if you are using machine learning model for decision, then you may have uncertainty in, in your decision. And you may have even wrong recognition if you are using machine learning models for autonomous systems. So uh, you may have a crash and, and such mission critical applications, you have to really consider uh, uncertainty in the data. So in fact, uh, almost all the time, you have reliability at risk. So the problem of unreliability. So uh, if you are trying to use machine learning for robotics or humanoid robots, you should know whether you give them exam or not. So, and the same thing. So these are, there are many programmed miscalculations. So in general, you have performance variability. 
models can perform differently for different data sets, even the process for which they are trained is the same. And you have uh, prediction inaccuracy, risk in decision-making process, there are many, uh, and also you have problem of proportionality and generalization of your model. And uh, you have also already seen adversarial attack. So uh, in general, in mission critical applications, we have to be careful whether we can really trust machine learning models to make for us decisions. And in general, I say machine learning models are decision support systems. So the human cannot, for the time being, the human cannot be taken out of the loop. In fact, I, I have read one paper uh, taking the human out of the loop using variation of semantics for machine learning. I, I do not think we'll take the human out of the loop for every application. So therefore, healthcare, medical devices, of, uh, and aviation industry, autonomous vehicles, industrial control systems, public safety, emergency response, uh, for instance, nuclear, nuclear uh, energy produ production. We have to be careful whether we, uh, we have to be sure whether we use uh, machine learning models to, uh, we leave everything for machine learning. Uh, that's very important. Fourth, space exploration and satellite systems. So, uh, because these are highly uh, expensive uh, explorations and satellite systems are also in general expensive, so we have to be careful when we apply machine learning models. So, uh, but in general, there are strategies in the literature. People do uncertainty quantification to quantify what will be the variability, what's the confidence interval of my, per the performance of the machine learning model. And uh, they, they are also have called ensemble learning methods, uh, robust optimization. So probabilistic modeling, variation approach is widely used. But uh, now I'm going to uh, probabilistic modeling with respect to frequentist approach, actually. So uh, I don't say that what I'm going to present is a totally, uh, is a method that should be used by itself, but it should be uh, showing a new direction relatively. So uh, in general, uh, what Bapnik in his book from 1973, uh, it said, given a data set, data set of samples, uh, draw independently from a drawn independently from fixed but unknown distribution function. That means the data are samples of certain random variables. This is actually the theory as we, we are using. So the loss function in uh, supervised learning is just has this form in almost every cases. So then according to him, there is a distribution within whi with which we do uh, expect expected risk minimization which is written in terms of actually in the traditional sense, uh, we have integral of the loss function according to a certain probability measure, assuming the data, uh, data uh, X and Y represent uh, a random variable. So in the classical machine learning, that is the loss function, which is usually optimized. It's usually optimized. Uh, now in general, we have these assumptions and uh, I use this compact notations. So I go to the classical theorem of Chebyshev. It says the following. The probability, if you have a random variable Z, uh, and a negative function H, the probability of holding H of Z greater than or equal to a number Epsilon is less than or equal to one over Epsilon, the expected value. So that means the probability is less than the expected value. Properly speaking, if you just simply uh, call Z this random variable, H the uh, square root function, and then you will have this representation. Then instead of uh, the expectation, why don't we minimize the probability? Actually, you can see the discrepancy. So th that's the classical approach. Because uh, I was a bit uh, confused with uh, the meaning of Actually, I get usually confused with the meaning of expectation, uh, 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 expected risk minimization. For me, the actually, that is the risk representation than this one. So the true meaning, because uh, risk is usually measured in terms of probabilities. So therefore, instead of minimizing the expected risk, I prefer to minimize the probability. So that's the difference. So there is a gap between them. 
how much the gap is, then uh, I have never seen such quantification. But anyway, this is more a better representation of loss function than the usual one. I could have stopped here, actually. Could have stopped here. So, uh, but uh, that problem, instead of living by expectation, we uh, just minimize, minimize this. But the problem is uh, it's better to reformulate this one in a different form. So I simply take one minus alpha, simply it's a representation, I, but there is a meaning behind that. So subject to, so this can be reformulated in a different way. In fact, it is equal to, but there's no problem if I just make it less than or equal to. So therefore, that is the reformulation of the problem in terms of so-called probabilistic constraints. So the one minus alpha here is the risk of your uh, approximation error being greater than or equal to a certain epsilon is less than or equal to one minus alpha. That is it. So this alpha is usually between zero and one because I would like to keep it with a reliability level or probabilistic level. So, but this problem itself can be uh, restated differently for sake of theoretical investigation as under the assumption uh, measure zero property. Uh, this representation and this representation are equivalent, assuming that actually the satisfaction, the satisfaction of this constraint with um, one minus alpha probability is equivalent to with the uh, violation of this constraint by, uh, for the violation means less than one, one uh, less than epsilon, but due to this I can write e equality over here is greater than or equal to alpha. So uh, now what I do is in general, uh, we don't claim to be alpha to be greater than one, usually uh, to be between uh, near to one. So I simply drop taking alpha as a variable for the current investigation, I mean. So simply keep, I would like to keep the approximation error below a certain epsilon, so very near to actually zero. In machine learning, actually, that gap of this, this cannot be zero in general. Uh, some, uh, because uh, we know that, that machine learning models are non-convex, and um, I don't think that the expectation minimization will guarantee total zero. In some cases, get having some, some a degree of uh, accuracy that's not exactly zero may give a better performance, uh, say, in recommended systems, and detecting whether an object is a human being or not. That might be an efficient, uh, sufficient uh, accuracy. But we like to keep that accuracy with high reliability, say 0 0.9, This is what we usually do. So then uh, I take alpha as a constant, then I solve this optimization problem, where I say this uh, approximation error is less than uh, epsilon, Actually, I, re I wrote it, but I keep this one less than or equal. So for uh, sake of uh, uh, degree of freedom, we could have fixed it here, for instance, for epsilon 10 to the power of minus 5 or 10 to the power of minus 7. We did that in the experimentation later on in the toy example. So this is a problem that uh, I suggest to solve for training machine learning models to speak the truth instead of the expectation. So this gives more degree of freedom. So unfortunately, that problem that I have stated in, in general is not really uh, trivial to solve because uh, a chance constraint optimization, probabilistic constraint uh, constraints are usually difficult. So, uh, but it can be restated. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you how we can address that problem uh, if we can approximate this one by smoother uh, representations. So uh, the thing is the following, the probability, I, I put in theta uh, tilde, epsilon and theta itself, the model parameter and the accu accuracy of approximation together, I call it uh, theta tilde. And then uh, this is uh, our chance constraint. Uh, we can reformulate it by this to be and not to be uh, condition because of the symmetry of probability. It can be written like that, but this can be written in terms of integral uh, like this. Uh, and then uh, I can write this one into expectation as a constraint, but the problem is uh, you have a jump function to represent the chance constraint 
uh, like that. So that is a difficulty that we have in general. And also the other difficulty is you are trying to integrate over a set. It's not yet known for because theta is a uh, decision variable. So uh, equation one, which I showed you before, is difficult to evaluate. And the probability function, which I have uh, shown you before, is in general non-smooth and very hard directly to evaluate. So what uh, I did in the co uh, uh, talk that I gave uh, today in the morning, and uh, in, during almost 15 years, from 2008 to 2021, as I was in Ilme now, uh, through the DFG funding, thank, I really am very thankful for that. So uh, I designed a function which looks like a logistic function, but actually not. So uh, new because of its monotony with respect to tau. If you embed, if you simply drop this one, you have a logistic function somehow modified, but you don't have monotony with respect to tau. So that, but this function monotonous with respect to tau. So uh, and not only that, this function is smooth and differentiable and approximates the jump function, its Heaviside function, monotonically. So using that function, I can define two two parametric functions, one in with respect to, uh, I simply uh, replace S with uh, my uh, defining function of the chance constraint, with the other with minus. So there are, this, this is due to the symmetry of the probability. Then interestingly, that function, these two functions are, are smooth and differential because my, uh, the, the GH function is differential. And not only that, we have, I have monotonic approximation like this, and not only that, I have convergence. This convergence actually can be shown to be uniform. So therefore, instead of the chance constraint, I uh, solve two problems. These two problems, so I replace that uh, the uh, one, one of them with this, the other one with this one, I have two problems because of symmetry, and they have this, uh, I have these two feasible sets respectively for both of them. And for my probabilistic constraint optimization, I have this feasible set. Uh, in the theory, 20, 15, 17, we have proved that these two sets monotonically, they just sandwich P. And not only that, uh, I can show that, we can show, we have already shown that they converge to P. And if you discretize tau, if you take a sequence of taus converging to zero, according to the theory, and you have a convergence of uh, the, the, the inner problem and the outer problem to 2p. To so that means that difficult problem can be sandwiched by two uh, easier to solve optimization problems or feasible sets. That is, that is the beauty. So, in fact, geometrically, you can easily see as you expand M, it fills P as tau goes to zero. As you just uh, deflate S, it goes to zero. So the two problems, as I decrease, the two parametric problems, as I decrease, uh, decrease tau, they just fill P, and that is very interesting. So the theory is there. So now, uh, how to solve the two problems? I solve two problems according to this algorithm. So I reduce, I start with tau zero, I solve the two optimization problems, and then if the termination tolerance is not satisfied, that means that both problems have the same objective function. The only difference in the feasible set. So uh, as long as they're objective, because for the inner problem, the objective function is bigger, always bigger than the objective function of the outer problem. So therefore, but if their gap, as I reduced, and as a tau, and as I solve the problem, if the gaps come near and almost equal, then I terminate, so that is it. So in general, theoretically, we can show that the solutions of the inner and the outer approximation problem converge respectively to the solution of the probabilistic constraint problem. The theory is already done, actually. So, now, we want to test whether this method, this approach works well or not. So instead of going for a very hard problem, first you try it for, for a very simple problem. So uh, I gave it to my PhD student, Mr. Remy, uh, just uh, I think uh, uh, one month, two months ago, 
to really see whether our idea works or not. First, uh, we simply, he, he took this function y is equal to sine of x, and he described x and then generated uh, values, a data set, to do simulation. The data set is generated between, for the sake of simplicity, between minus pi and pi. And he designed a neural network with one uh, input and one output according to the function, and with three hidden layers, and with this data. With this data, as I said, we fix alpha. We fix it also the error, the error of the approximation. That means that uh, the loss function is, uh, the L function is less than or equal to 10 to the power of minus three with 0 0.95 reliability level. In fact, there is no, nothing special about this. We can take 10 to the power of minus seven, 10 to the power of minus nine, and here also near to, near to one reliability. We did the computa he did the computation with respect to only for timing with respect to the outer approximation. And then we got this result actually. As we reduce tau, we know that our approximation gets more accurate. And then uh, we see what the output from TensorFlow and the output from uh, the outer approximation is almost, TensorFlow is a blue one and the outer approximation here with more accurate result is a green one. So we want to know whether we are performing well or not, at least for this very small problem. In fact, uh, TensorFlow uh, gave this, this degree of accuracy according to coefficient of determination, which is frequently used in, uh, in, uh, in prediction models. So, but uh, our outer approximation with even 10 to the power of four, min four, uh, ten, four time, 10 to the power of minus four, uh, we got uh, this uh, accuracy. And near to one, R square near to one is always the best, a better approximation in general. So the computation is really to expect as you reduce tau, the computation will be, uh, will take too much time because we are solving a probabilistic problem. So uh, we used, because we have a constraint optimization problem, we have to use the interior point method for this, for this problem. So not the classical simply gradient descent, so classic gradient can be modified and can be used, but anyway, we have to use a constraint optimization method. So, but with respect to the inner approximation, we have a problem. We know from our previous experimentation, when you work with the inner approximation, because it's smaller, uh, it lies always the solution is inside, so we need a bigger computational resource which is actually missing right now at our center. So, uh, but the result, it seems, as we reduce tau, even for tau 0 0.05, we have this approximation, which is not satisfactory, but this is a preliminary work. So the outer approximation works well, the inner approximation needs more computational resources. This is what we discovered. And uh, actually, the path, taken, uh, the path less taken could involve a lengthy journey in general because we don't know, nobody can give us information how long it takes to, uh, or when you just go along a given journey. Uh, we have now a page before a starter. So a PhD student has started. So we need a better solution, algorithm for e the inner approximation. We need real world data sets. We have to do comparative studies and benchmark, and we need high performance computation uh, because it's a preliminary study. So, but uh, still we cannot stay, stay there. What if, now in general, in uh, Bayesian methods, people try to, find to, to quantify theta in terms of a probability distribution. Can we really do it with a frequent approach? Yes, the, that's uh, what we are going to do next. And, uh, and also, the good thing today, we have generated AI, and uh, specifically the parameterization trick we are going to use it over here. So that means we assume that theta has a certain distribution with given parameters, so we'd like to determine the parameters out of the optimization, or somehow by some other means. The next is, what do we gain by using variance? Because machine learning models are already non-convex, why don't we go for the variance? Because that might bring some performance reliability and address variability of the model as data change, if we learn the distribution of the data. So therefore, that is the next step. Next step, in many cases, there are distributional shifts in data. 
what if we consider so-called distributional robust modeling using chance constraint? These are things that we are going to do subsequently. In fact, uh, when I say this, I'm inviting people to, co to cooperate with us to do research in this direction. So in any case, you have preferences. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bebe. Any questions? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, could I see the slide where you were demonstrating your uh, experiment with the sine function? I think no, no, no. The one where you said, you know, like that the uh, resources are limited and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this here. One. So something which I find interesting is that uh, like this error is somehow not symmetric. Yeah, it's not symmetric. Uh, yeah, like do you have any idea like why would that be that it's like fitting it well below zero but above zero not, uh, yeah. Um, I cannot exactly tell what the computer have, uh, has done in there. Actually, the implementation is done by, uh, I think it looks like you have a symmetry. But what we need is from our experience, from inner approximation, you need more data with the same set of data for both. For inner approximation, usually we need more data than the data that we have. So we discovered, I think it took uh, hours, several hours, because he has to connect with a server which is at uh, another research center from the uh, RIC, uh, IMS RIC. And it really took too long and I told him, okay, for the time being, we stop here. The outer approximation is showing us we are right we are in the right direction. Now we need a big computer to do this. So more data will be the solution. In fact, we have seen with, with one PhD student, uh, he has now already completed the working at Fraunhofer, we have a problem with the inner approximation. We need to know where to have sufficient data because if that function is a jump function. So you have uh, the same problem with a vanishing gradient which usually occurs in, uh, in these uh, activation functions particularly the log, um, the usual uh, sigmoid activation function. We have also the problem. So for those areas where you detect your gradient is almost zero or it is exploding because you have such a function, then you have to have sufficient time. These tricks we didn't use. Uh, that's why I say there is a lot of work in this direction. Hmm. Any other questions? So I saw you had an algorithm. Uh, yeah, an that algorithm. You did, but you use, it seems you didn't use that. You said you used an interior point I, method. I, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right. This is this is simply a conceptual algorithm. Okay. Yeah, conceptual algorithm. Okay. It's yeah. only conceptual. <laughs> Actually, this should be modified. You are right. Okay. Uh, because I have to speak about interior point methods and so and so. Uh -huh. so this is from our old paper. Uh, tremend as it is. I Sorry. See. I'll modify it in the future. So. Your work have this flavor of this uh, primal dual optimization, yeah. where then if you are able to close the gap, then uh, you are, you're you're solving the problem. If you get a gap zero, then you have the exact solution. So is that the thing you are thinking about here when you have this this, this majorization and minorization, right? This inner product, in in inner function, and the outer function. If the gap closes, then it get yeah. exactly your uh, Actually, this is totally, uh, it's not about uh, primal dual. The mm -hmm. primal dual is for one single problem. Okay. Now we have two problems. Two different problems. One coming from outside, oh, the oh other yeah. coming actually, from right. inside. So mm -hmm. This is not primal dual. Okay. The primal dual is actually in the interior point method itself. itself so right. that we, we didn't really develop an algorithm. We are using existing solver. In okay. fact, uh, I just said this, one of the best software which is for interior point method is this one, yeah. which we are using in several research mm -hmm. uh, work. Yeah. So we didn't develop that. You didn't, yeah. okay. This only test, as I say, we are simply f trying to prove our idea. Yeah. And then in terms of uh, the future work you presented, 
I think there are people looking at some of those problems, but it not with uh, probabilistic constrained pro problems. Yeah, there so are. So there's something you can learn from what they have been doing. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, the actually, distribution and robust optimization is quite related to the research that I've been doing for more than 15 years, mm -hmm. but uh, they didn't consider it in this sense in, in this machine learning. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank, thank you very you. much.